So in this video, I want to talk about the different medications for the treatment of type 2 diabetes and mainly focus on their mechanism of action. So before we get started with the drugs, we need to understand how does glucose homeostasis work in our body. So if we eat a meal, glucose gets absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. It's going to reach our blood. And so the pancreatic beta cell are going to sense glucose levels. So if glucose is going to rise, it's going to be taken up into the pancreatic beta cell. And the glucose is broken down to get energy in form of ATP. So the ATP is going to shut down this so-called ATP-sensitive potassium channel. So the potassium channel is going to close as ATP rises, and therefore you're going to accumulate positive charges. As a consequence, voltage gauges, calcium channels are going to open up, and calcium is going to get into the cell. So whenever calcium gets into the cell, we're going to trigger exocytosis. So these vesicles that contain insulin are going to fuse with the plasma membrane and insulin is released. So as a consequence of the rising glucose levels, we get insulin release. And insulin stimulates the storage of our cellular fools. So once insulin is released, what are the target organs? One example is the skeletal muscle. In the skeletal muscle, glucose will facilitate the translocation of GLUT4. So there will be more of these transporters that can take up glucose. And so as long as we take more glucose up into the skeletal muscle, this will decrease our plasma glucose levels. Also, another important target organ is the liver, for example. We will shut down new glucose production, so gluconeogenesis is going to be inhibited. Other organs that play a role in glucose homeostasis are the kidney. In the kidney, glucose is reabsorbed, so definitely how much reabsorption happens in the kidney also has influence on glucose homeostasis and on our plasma glucose levels. So what is the problem with type 2 diabetes? So normally when we eat something, glucose levels are going to rise, insulin is going to be secreted, and then it's going to exert its effect. For example, to have the skeletal muscle take up more glucose, and that will help to decrease plasma glucose levels. But what happens in a type 2 diabetic patient? Insulin is going to be released, but there's a problem with the tissue sensitivity to insulin. So as you can see here, there's the insulin receptor is present, but there are some rearrangement in the intracellular signaling. So insulin cannot completely exert its effects. Therefore, the body will try harder and make even more insulin to overcome this um, decreased tissue sensitivity to insulin. And we call this a relative insulin deficiency because it's relative because the body tries hard and makes even more insulin than a normal patient. But it's still an insulin deficiency because it cannot fully exert its effects. So how can we treat now type 2 diabetic patients? So one option is, and this is going to be our first class that we're going to discuss, we can just increase insulin secretion. So just get out more insulin out of the beta cell. So there are two classes that do that, and that are the sulfonylureas and the non-sulfonylureas. So what they both do in a very similar fashion, they just inhibit this ATP-sensitive potassium channel. So if you just shut down the potassium channel, that's going to lead to positive charges accumulation in the cell. So it's going to lead to membrane depolarization. Calcium is going to get in via the voltage-gated calcium channel, and so insulin will be released. So this is a mechanism of action independent of what our glucose level in the body does. It just does it by itself, just closing the potassium channel and therefore leading to a release of insulin, so kind of an extra insulin. So the sulfonylureas all start with gly, glyburide or glipicide, and the non-sulfonylureas have the common ending glynide, nateglynide, repaglynide. Our next class of drugs also get us out insulin, 
but they do so in a glucose-dependent fashion. So in contrast to the sulfonylureas and the non-sulfonylureas that just shut down the potassium channel and get us out insulin, those guys, and these are the GLP-1 agonist and the DPP-4 inhibitors, they also get us out some insulin, but they do it in a glucose-dependent fashion. So glucose needs to be there in order that we get the insulin out. So how do they work? So the GLP-1 agonists act at the GLP-1 receptor. So this is a G-protein coupled receptor that is found on the pancreatic beta cell. It's GS coupled, so we know that GS coupling leads to uh, activation of protein kinase A, so the calcium channel is going to be phosphorylated. And if we have membrane depolarization, so if glucose is around, leading to membrane depolarization, then we can help facilitate the influx of calcium and therefore have some insulin released via this exocytotic process. The GLP-1 agonists all end in tides, so exenatide, liraglutide, so these are the tides. Now, the other class that we're going to discuss in this context are the DPP-4 inhibitors. They all end in gliptin, cytagliptin or linagliptin. So you can think about it, that the in ending should remind you it's an inhibitor and there's a P in it, so maybe that can help you to remember it's a DPP-4 inhibitor. So what does DPP-4 do? It breaks down normally the GLP-1, which comes from the gastrointestinal tract from the terminal ileum. So it breaks it down. So if you inhibit this, we're going to have more GLP-1, and the GLP-1 can act on the pancreatic beta cell to facilitate the same process that we just discussed. So GLP-1 does actually more than just acting at the GLP-1 receptor on the pancreatic beta cell, and so do the GLP-1 agonists. So let's discuss this a little bit more in detail. So GLP-1, which stands for glucose-like peptide 1, is one of many gastrointestinal peptides. And GLP-1 is made in the terminal ileum in response to nutrients. So when you have nutrients in the terminal ileum, that actually tells you that, number one, you ate too much, or that gastric emptying is kind of very fast and is pushing the food too fast forward. So normally you should not have too many nutrients in the ileum. So once there are nutrients sensed in the terminal ileum, GLP-1 is secreted. And what it does, number one, it acts on the brain to decrease appetite, which makes sense because if you have nutrients in the ileum, you should stop eating. And then number two, it will also slow gastric emptying to make sure that the food can be properly digested and that there's enough time to absorb all the nutrients so that they are not going to reach the terminal ileum anymore. So GLP-1 agonists, the tides, have similar actions. They also act in the brain to decrease appetite. They also act in the stomach to decrease gastric emptying. So it's not only the action on the beta cell that is helpful for the, for the diabetic patient, it's also the decrease in appetite and the decrease in gastric emptying. And they are even approved, at least lyraglutide, as an obesity drug. So that should make sense. It is now a bit surprising that the DPP-4 inhibitors do not have exactly the same effects. It turns out if you use a DPP-4 inhibitor, you don't get the effects on the brain and you don't get the effects on the stomach. So if you use a DPP-4 inhibitor, the major effect or the main effect is going to be on the GLP-1 receptor in the pancreatic beta cell. This probably has to do with that the DPP-4 is an enzyme that is not very selective. It degrades a lot of different peptides, and maybe some of them have opposing effects. They cancel each other out. It's not really clear, but clear is that the DPP-4 inhibitors have a main effect on the pancreatic beta cell, not on the brain and not on the stomach. So the next drugs that we're going to discuss are our so-called insulin sensitizers. So we would call metformin, our first-line drug for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, an insulin sensitizer, as well as the thiosolidine dions as an insulin sensitizer. So the thiosolidine dions are TCDs. So um, 
they all end in glitterzone, so you have the Z in the name, so there an example is pyoglitazone or rosy glitazone. So what do these insulin sensitizers do? So metformin has as a target AMP kinase. It's an AMP kinase activator. So AMP kinase is downstream insulin signaling. The thiosolidiodions are activating the PPAR gamma receptor, a nuclear receptor. And this also can activate downstream AMP kinase. So what does it mean? They act downstream insulin signaling. So these are mechanisms that converge with downstream insulin signaling. So you can think about it just like insulin does its job, but they don't care what insulin does. They just jump on the signaling of insulin at a later point, but in the end also facilitate a very similar signaling pathway. And therefore, their target organs are basically identical with insulin, so also mainly the skeletal muscle and the liver, also the fat. And they also trigger similar things that you would expect from insulin to happen. Another mechanism that diabetic agents can facilitate is either get rid of glucose, so enhance glucose excretion, or try to get less absorption of glucose to start with. That would b both also help to decrease our plasma glucose levels. So for the drugs that enhance glucose excretion, we have our SGLT2 inhibitors, so sodium glucose transporters. So these are the gliflozins, canagliflozin or empagliflozin. So they inhibit this sodium glucose transporter that is responsible for reabsorption of glucose. So if you inhibit this transporter that normally takes back the glucose from the kidney into the plasma, well, then you're going to get rid of more glucose, and that's their mechanism of action. Another possibility is to use a drug that decreases glucose absorption. So you probably know that we can only absorb monosaccharide. So if you eat something and have glycogen, it needs to be broken down to the monosaccharide to, in order to be absorbed. So alpha-glucosidase is an enzyme that breaks down, for example, glycogen. So if you inhibit this, well, there will be no monosaccharides, and therefore you're going to absorb less glucose. That's another way to decrease plasma glucose levels. So here's just a summary slide of all the different medications that we discussed. This concludes the video on the different mechanisms of actions of type 2 diabetes agents.